I was saved into the Jesus movement in, in the mid-70s, and I was part of a, um, a movement that actually planted a church in San Francisco. Right. It was the Lighthouse Ranch, yeah, yeah. and uh, they planted 80 churches before they began to subside. And that's kind of the way that we thought about, uh, the way we thought about the apostolic was it was mainly about church planting. Right. And that's probably one dimension. You know, how do you see that? Like, what, what other dimensions are there for you? And... Uh, how much importance do you put on the church planting side of things or the missionary side of things? Well, it's, it, it does come down to the meaning of the word apostle. It's the right. sent one. Yeah. So it has to be central to what we think of as the apostle. But it's more than a church planter. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do agree with that right. concept. But it's, it's church planting in the sense of planting groups of people into the earth that can culturize, bring transformation. I mean, that's, yeah. that would be a broader definition. But I do agree that, uh, that the, the whole concept of being sent and planting uh, churches is, is what is, it's what is needed all over the world. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's a healthy part. And it's important. It's critical. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because over my years, I've gotten to sort of spend time with probably, I don't know, maybe six or eight different apostolic leaders of different flavors. Mm -hmm. right. And there are different flavors. Yeah. And so if you were to kind of say, well, what are, the, what are the three or four things that would be common to all? Because it's not necessarily a builder, not necessarily a planter, not ever necessarily a pioneer. Yeah. Um, obviously, I think one of the things I've seen with you is just that sense of uh, the supernatural, being in touch with the Holy Spirit, other dimensions that you see? Um, hope. Oh, okay. Hope. That's good. Uh, healthy apostles always have hope. Always, always, always have hope. Wow. And they also always have vision. Yes. They're not waiting to be rescued. They're wanting to build something. Yes. And that's, uh, that's at the core of who they are. Yeah. They've been called. They've been, they've been called with an assignment to build something that accurately and adequately represents another world. That's so good. And uh, there's a, it's like uh, the, the apostolic heart and mind, uh, same, same with the prophetic actually, yeah. is there's this perception of, if I could use the term heaven's blueprint on how things should work. Yeah. There's just that perception. There's that, it, it's not that they're more spiritual than the evangelist. It, it's, it has nothing to do with it. It has to do with, with where God put you to see. And so the apostle prophet have this, this position to see blueprints. That's the evangelist right. sees the hearts of men yes. see, or the pastor, you know, you, yeah. you get the point. So it's not, it's not that one is greater than the other. It's just the perception or the, the assignment they have determines how they're going to see. Wow. And so the whole apostolic prophetic yeah. is, uh, is central in that sense because God lets them see with burning conviction the blueprints of heaven and there's always there's always hope there's always vision and there's always the um not a drive but a focus to build yeah building is huge that's so good yeah well it's interesting because you know when you look at the first great awakening you know you've got jonathan edwards you have uh, george whitfield and then you have john wesley and it's interesting to look at, you know, Whitfield was, seemed obviously more anointed than Wesley. They had a parting of ways at some point over theology, and that got mended towards the end. Yeah. Um, but there are still churches today. In fact, the Methodist Church just had another sort of, let's call it a re reformation around some biblical issues and a whole new life coming into the Methodist Church. Talk about that aspect of the building, that aspect of the strategic that John Wesley had that seemed like George Whitfield didn't have. No, no, you're exactly right. They both had tremendous power in their preaching, which was yeah. interesting, uh, for conversion, for salvation. But Wesley had this motto, uh, organized to beat the devil. And uh, that's why his movement was called Methodist, Method. Right. You know, they, they, would, they yeah. championed methods or strategies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Lord used that brilliance to create something that lasted longer than his life, lifetime. Right. And, uh, and that, in, in a sense, is what, I, I don't know that it'd be fair for me to call Wesley an apostle and Whitfield an evangelist. I, I don't see it clear enough to yeah. say that. But you can see that. That, uh, that an apostle is supposed to build something that contains or sets uh, parameters, boundaries for a movement. Yeah. And uh, that, that uh, certain values are never compromised. 
certain values are never compromised. Yes. And that, that we hold to these, that these things, I call them cornerstones of thought in our world. You know, the whole God is good, nothing's impossible. Uh, everything was dealt with at Calvary, purchased at Calvary, and that every person is significant. Those are cornerstones of thought that just should not be compromised. And if we can discover what God is saying to us in our lifetime, yeah. and then adhere to them, then we will... Uh, it's a weird illustration, but it's like a foundation of a house. In the kingdom, it attracts building supplies. Mm. It's it's like you get it in place, you attract what yeah. what uh, what is uh, goes into the actual building. Yes. And I, I've just watched it in the kingdom for years. When people get certain things established in their foundational beliefs on why they're on planet Earth, mm. when that's there, and they maintain that sense of worship and honor, then they attract the supplies. They attract so the insights, right yeah. No, that's so good. In fact, you know, one of my favorite scriptures uh, as it pertains to the apostolic gifting is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul describes himself as a master builder. Yeah. He's not the architect. Obviously, the, the builder and maker is God, yeah. but he's receiving the blueprint, and then he's gathering the right people, the right resources to actually bring it about, yeah. to make it happen. Uh, interestingly, too, that's... That's juxtaposed to chapter 4, where he says, you have many teachers, you don't have many fathers. So the two aspects that I see in the apostolic are the builder, the, the father, you know, that, the, that dynamic. Um, you know, we live in a season right now where the church is primarily built on what I would call a pastoral foundation. Yeah. You know, Ephesians 2.20, however, says the church is to be built on a foundation of apostles and prophets. Yeah. Now, some theologians would say, well, that's referring to the 12 apostles of the Lamb, and that's referring to Old Testament prophets. But in the very next few verses, it says, now these things are being revealed. So there's a very present reality that's being described in the book of Ephesians. And obviously, chapter 4 kind of culminates and sort of puts it all together. Give us your thoughts on those passages and how... You know, the Ephesians 4 passage works in your understanding. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, uh, there's no question. It's, it's easy to take the large promises and prophetic decrees of Scripture and put them off into a period of time for which we have no responsibility. That's, it's avoiding that's responsibility. Yeah. And, uh, and we have to own up to the fact that, that he said these gifts are given until. Yes. This is an operation until this happens. What is it? Unity of faith, we're not quite there, be at least another week. <laughs> Unity of faith to the knowledge of the yeah. Son of God, that there's going to be this massive revelation of the Son of God. And that we would come to, the, uh, to a mature man. That's, that's the, one of the most extraordinary promises in the Bible, is mm. that the body of Christ would come into a place of function as a singular mature man. In other words, Christ on earth again, his body demonstrated represented, represented, represented. And, uh, and those gifts are to equip unto that. Wow. And it happens through every person functioning in their role, every one of us receiving grace from these gifts. Our lives are shaped by the grace we receive from the prophet, from the evangelist. I need these people in my life, regardless of my role. I need those people releasing a, the grace that they carry into my life. I think better when I've been with, with the prophet. That's I right. see better right. when, when I'm hanging out with an evangelist. Yeah. I, I get moved more with human need to when I'm with that pastor, mm -hmm. the precision of the teacher. I need that to need, you know, those are all gifts that still are, are important for me. Yes. And so what we do is we, we release a grace that enables the church to become something. And, uh, and it's, it happens through ministry. Yeah. It happens through ministries. These, grace, these gifts are given to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So the point is, is that maturity is marked by increased responsibility. Mm. God rewards, right. he rewards all growth with pruning and all maturity with increased responsibility. Yeah, because the, the wilderness didn't, yeah. didn't lead to the Hawaiian Islands where you sit on a beach in a beach house the rest of your life. Right. It led to a promised land where they had to go to work. And that was maturity. That is so true. And so in the kingdom, the church functioning as the church is what models maturity. Wow. 
And it's that maturity that brings us into what he said should happen. Uh, That's so good. I mean, one of the challenges, obviously, in the debate of do these gifts still exist today? You know, is the apostle and prophet still relevant? Obviously, most of the church would say yes to uh, the pastor, (laughs) yes to the teacher, and in many cases, yes to the evangelist. But one thing that I think is pretty clear in the passage itself, if we're careful, and we have to look at it as a whole passage, 17, I mean, 7 to 16, <clears throat> that each of these gifts was given at the same time. They're all distinct from one another, but they were given for the same purpose. Yes. So they're given at the ascension of Christ, which wasn't the day of Pentecost. It was several days before. It was given for the, you know, the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And then unto what you were talking about, that maturity and that responsibility that's, that culminates in verse 16, where every member is doing its part and the body grows and it builds itself up in love. Yeah. That that reality, and, and so again, you know, to all of our friends who are you know, still trying to figure this out, you know, it's pretty clear to me in just a simple treatment of that passage. But I think one of the challenges that we've had is that we've unfortunately put all the emphasis on verse 11. Now it's an important verse, you know, when we name those five gifts, and they're all aspects of Christ, they're all parts of who he is. But really, it seems like the primary verse in the whole passage is verse 12, the equipping of the saints. Can you talk about that? Like, how does that work? You know, what, you know, obviously, there's impartation, there's teaching, there's training, there's other dimensions to the equipping dynamic. Talk about that. Well, each of those giftings, as you mentioned, represent an aspect of Jesus himself, his life, his ministry. And, and what these gifts do, um, let's just take prophet. When a prophet ministers in his rightful place in the church, his rightful voice, his rightful influence, the church sees better. Yeah. They see better. Yeah. They see, they function with the grace of a prophet. It doesn't mean they are prophets. It just means that grace enables them to function as the prophet does. Mm -hmm. Same with the evangelist. The evangelist in in that is to equip the saints. So it's not just the guy who holds big crusades. He actually, his influence in the church is to make God's people evangelistic. Mm -hmm. And the same with the pastor, to be able to give compassionate care over people in need. And the apostle, that whole blueprint concept for transformation, each of these gifts, the teacher, yeah. that people would have a heart for the study of scripture, that they get that from the teacher. It doesn't mean they're a fivefold gift, but, but they can function in a teaching communicative role to Im- impart understanding of scripture. Yeah. You know, they talk with their neighbor, their neighbor. They help to disciple them because they led them to Christ. They're in a teaching role. It doesn't mean they're necessarily the one of the fivefold, but they operate under the influence of the teacher that influences them. Mm. And, if, and if, a lot of the reaction, though, is because of, um, you know, people have used titles for self-promotion. Yeah. And a lot of the reaction is just they don't like that. Right. You know, they don't like, you know, the, the guy, you know, flaunting himself, uh, you, you know, going to another city and I'm the apostle, I should be in charge here. Well, that's just dumb. <laughs> that's just dumb. It's all of this is relational. And it's, and it's all out of servitude. It's all out of the, the compassion and the desire to see Jesus exalted and people strengthened. And if you don't have those two things, you know, go find something else to do. Yeah. But uh, giving yourself a title doesn't make it happen. And so a lot of the reaction is that. So if we can just get a generation that is comfortable uh, with proper acknowledgement of Scripture, but not use it for self-promotion. Use it just help, helping us to understand this is my assignment in serving, mm. and this is what I want to contend for. If we can, if we can do that, we'll, we'll get rid of a, a lot of the uh, doubt about those being uh, real today. Yeah. And most of, of as you mentioned, uh, the church functions around the concept of a pastor. It's not evil, it's just incomplete. Yeah. You know, the, the pastor, my goodness, we, we need that tremendously. Yeah. But, uh, but there's a whole other aspect that can help to make us even healthier. That's so good.